You're listening to a podcast of Wake Up With Word, hosted by Solomon Jones on 900 AM WURD.com. Good morning. This is Solomon Jones on 900 AM WURD, the Wake Up With Word show. And we're back with Mary Beth Gassman. She's a professor of higher education in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Her areas of expertise include the history of American higher education, minority serving institutions with an emphasis on historically black colleges and universities, racism and diversity and higher education leadership. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good. Well, it's good to talk to you. You know, I almost went to the Penn uh, School of the Graduate School of Education, was in fact accepted there, but then kind of changed my mind. But uh, you guys are doing great things there at Penn and and we appreciate you. So thank you. I I read this story about you and, and was very interested. I remembered when you talked about why there weren't more, why there wasn't more minority hiring in higher education. Can, can you just talk about that uh, this morning? Why isn't there more minority hiring in, in higher education? Well, um, what I said that got a lot of attention was that it's because, um, you know, we as institutions don't want that. And so um, I think people were kind of shocked that I said that, but that's what I have uh, seen in my experience, you know, and I, I think that there are lots of presidents and provosts that want to see the diversification of the faculty um, and even will incentivize it. But the problem is lies with the faculty and, you know, the faculty faculty like to replicate themselves and they like people who have mentors just like them. And they like people who have only elite degrees. And so what that does is it creates a club. And uh, and anytime you create a clique or a club, it's not going to be good for people overall. It's only going to be good for a certain group of people. And so, um, you know, I think that uh, the reason why we don't have a more diverse faculty, which we really have not seen much movement in the needle across the country and at Penn, um, is because uh, we don't have the will among faculty. You know, we, we need we need to. Faculty need to push faculty. We have control over faculty hiring, and it's our fault that we don't have uh, a greater representation of our country as a whole. You know, the interesting thing about about faculty jobs, I've, I've gone for one of those jobs, didn't get it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but but you, ha- you, you sit down before members of the faculty in the particular college that you are applying to. If it's in a university and you're going for a job in the journalism department, then you have to sit before a group of journalism professors who question you, look at your credentials, et cetera. And and they are really key to that decision. Is that how it works everywhere? It is. Uh What happens is basically um, faculty hire faculty. So sometimes uh, you know, when I, uh, I'll talk to students and they'll get really, really frustrated because they don't understand why uh, a dean or a provost or a president um, doesn't have complete control over those things. But that's not the way that, you know, the academy works. And um, the, the way that colleges and universities work overall, I mean, there are some exceptions, but by and large, especially at these highly selective ones, is that is that faculty make determinations about faculty. And there are some good reasons for that. There are good reasons because, you know, faculty are over the curriculum and, and the academic kind of enterprise of the institution. And that's, that's a good thing because they have academic freedom and they can, um, you know, they can ensure that all topics can be on the table for discussion and exploration. On the other hand, uh, you know, all systems can have some corruption in them. And what happens is that faculty, again, like I said, they tend to want people who had who have elite mentors who come from elite institutions that they deem elite, and they also like to replicate themselves. They like people who think like they think, and so um, in order to change that, you have to push back. And I do see some change taking place with younger faculty who are really beginning to push back. But I you see that happening? Yeah, I, I, but but how does it affect students? When they don't and I'm not even talking about just students of color, students, period, when they mm-hmm. don't see people who represent, uh, you know, who, who look different, who think differently, uh, who come from different places. What happens that what happens to students when 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 it's so homogenous? Well, I mean, this is one of the issues that I bring up constantly is, number one, it's not fair. 
it, it's not a fair learning experience. It's not an equitable learning experience to learn from people who, oh, let's say, you know, 76% of faculty across the country are white, right? And, and my institution falls into that statistic. And so um, that's not fair. And in fact, what research shows us is that if you have faculty members who look like you in terms of your gender, perhaps your race, and even who might have the same um, cultural or class background, that you are much more likely to feel empowered, to feel listened to, and to embrace your learning. So there is research that tells us that it is incredibly important to have a diverse faculty. I also think that, you know, um, that students have every right, all students, not, not just students of color, but all students have every right to want and ask for and demand to have a diverse faculty. And you know, one of the reasons why we have the diversity that we have is because students in the 1960s fought for that. You know, right. they, they pushed really hard. And so, so it, yeah, it does damage and it's not fair. And for me, I get really frustrated when I see people hoarding opportunity. Yeah. But, but the interesting thing about the story that I, that I read about you um, is that you come from a, from a different type, type of background, a background where, in fact, uh, you, you were around people who were all white. And you talked about your father in, in, in the story. What would you say? Um, well, so I grew up in a completely white community with the exception of a few Native Americans on, um, nearby, and, um, which people find really hard. They can't believe that I didn't meet anyone who was African-American until I was 18 years old, Right. Um, or Latino, or Jewish, or openly gay, or you know, or non-Lutheran Catholic. <laughs> Catholic. Um, so I um, I grew up in a community that was intensely racist, intensely homophobic. That was pretty much the norm then, but greatly sexist. Every kind of ism you could think of was taking place in this community where I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, which is up between Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. And so what I said about my father is. Uh, Because people always ask me, how can you be brave? You know, why are you so brave? Like, uh, white people ask me this constantly, okay? And my answer usually is, why aren't you brave? Because I can't think of a reason why you can't be brave and stand up for these things. And the reason why I'm brave is because I had to fight my father for a long time. And my father was an ardent racist. And, you know, I've given a TED Talk about this. I've written pretty extensively about my father trying to convince people like my father to change. Because in the, at the end of the day, my dad did change because of a friendship with an African-American man um, who he met late in life in a, you know, in a nursing home in another state. But, but um, for me, I fought my father every day. I fought him. And it, it caught, he was embarrassed by me. He was ashamed of me. He thought that my work was ridiculous for a long, long time. But I didn't let that stop me. And so I think that, you know, recently I was asked by a white woman, why are you so brave? And I just looked at her and I said, are you a tenured professor? And she said, yes. And I said, well, tell me why you aren't brave, because there is nothing that should stop you from standing up for your colleagues who are trampled on daily. Hmm. You know, there's nothing that should stop you. Nobody can do anything to you. And so, you know, I guess what I was writing about is that my bravery comes from fighting my father. And um, and the other reason I bring that up is because I think there are way too many white people who cover up racism in their family. And, you know, when Trump was elected, you had all these people say, well, my family voted for Trump, but they're not racist. No, they are racist. They're racist and they're sexist and they're homophobic and they're every other kind of ism. And we have to face that and we need to start talking to people about it. And, and educating them and, 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 you know, having conversation mm-hmm. instead of denying that we come from these families. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so in terms of, of how that plays out, not just politically, but in our educational system, in higher education, where we get our best and our brightest, where people go into upper management, where, where they filter out into every aspect of our lives. How do you fix the lack of diversity, the lack of people of color, black people in particular, in faculty? How do you fix it? Well, I actually think you can fix it pretty easily. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have put forth lots and lots of ideas. I think there are lots of ways to do it. One of the things that we know is that a lot of Ph.D. programs where faculty are coming from, where, you know, faculty come from, are actually fairly diverse. And, and there are many, many that are very, very diverse. There's many examples of success around the country. Many, 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 including, you know, the one that I'm a part of is hugely diverse. 
And um, and so one thing you can do is you can go to diverse programs, uh, PhD programs, and you can learn what they're doing and you can replicate that. That's pretty easy. The other thing that you can do is that you can make sure that search committees are trained because search committees get no training trained on how to do hiring, on how to have a diverse pool. As an administrator, you can demand a diverse pool. You can say, if someone comes to you with three or four white candidates, you can say, you know, there's something wrong here, and that's not representative of our nation and our students. And so you need to go back to the drawing board. You can't pick the candidates as an administrator, but you can certainly push back. Mm -hmm. Um, There are also other things you can do. If you don't see a lot of... um, diversity in the pool, then what you can do is you can start calling institutions that have a lot of diversity within their PhD programs and asking their, their faculty to have their PhD students apply to your program. So that's, that's another thing you can do. Um, you know, the, the, one of the biggest things that people can do is when you hear people, white people, this is mainly white people who are going to do this, when you hear them bring up the word quality during discussions of diversity, you can look them right in the eye and say, that's racist. There's no reason why we should ever bring up the word quality in discussions of diversity unless you're saying, you know, the only way that we can be a high quality program is if we are diverse. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, you but you've got to push back. And so when I hear people say that, typically what I say to them is, oh, so what you're saying is that the neighborhood's changing. You know how when people say the neighborhood's changing, they really Uh mean that black people are moving in. Right. 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 So I just Mm -hmm. I just point blank say things or if you're in a meeting. You know, this can happen across the board, not just in academia. If you're in a meeting and everyone in the room is white, say something. Mm -hmm. You know, I say something. If it's a meeting where people are making um, important decisions, I say something. I've even said things like, you know, it's mighty white in here. Mm -hmm. Or why are all white people making this decision? This Mm -hmm. doesn't seem right. Mm -hmm. This doesn't seem just. And so it takes people. And I think that white people need to be on the forefront of this speaking up and saying, this isn't right, Mm -hmm. instead of just sitting there in silence, which is what most white people do. Mm, That's Mary Beth Gassman. Let me just identify you very quickly. This is Mary Beth Gassman. She's professor of higher education in the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Her areas of expertise include the history of American higher education and minority serving institutions. So, uh, you know, it's it's funny because I'm in a lot of meetings and a lot of rooms where there aren't a lot of black people. Usually my wife and I jokingly call it uh, fulfilling King's dream because we're often the only black people in the room. Um, Mm -hmm. But you can't get black people in the room if you don't have black people in the pipeline. So so it really needs to start earlier than just the hiring process, doesn't it? It it does. It needs to start in the cultivating of doctoral students. It needs to start with with people when you have a student in your class as an undergrad and you notice that they're a really good writer or they're an incredible critical thinker or they have interesting ideas to pull them aside and say, you know what, have you ever thought about becoming a professor? A teacher said to me, you have potential. You could be a professor. And I looked at him and said, no, I can't. Poor people don't do that. And he said, yes, they do. And so just like that, all of us need to be saying to young people, yes, you, you can do this. You know, you have the potential to do this. And then you need to hold their hand while they're doing it and give them all the resources that it's needed. Because let me tell you, that's what happens to white people. All right. People hold their hand Mm -hmm. the whole way. Mm -hmm. Mary Beth Gassman, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning on WURD. Be sure to listen to Wake Up With Word, hosted by Solomon Jones, 7 a.m. till 10 a.m. Monday through Friday, exclusively on 900 a.m. WURD and 900 a.m. WURD.com.